All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. Teresa, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. I feel like I'm in such good company with all your other guests. You have some amazing guests on. Yeah, excited to chat a little bit. Um, I want to go back to really the very beginning because I always like to know what's the moment that you had an experience watching something where it was like, okay, this I, I'm noticing something about film or about TV that I've never noticed before that that really sparks something within you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are I have so many movies and TV shows that I like that span across genre and across format. Um, you know, I think I was always really drawn and loved the feeling of being in those big action movies, Armageddon, Con Air, even Face Off, um, all of these movies sort of. I was just like, these are so epic and they're yeah. so crazy and so aspirational and maybe not all of them are aspirational, but uh, just like pushing the boundaries of what can you think of happening to humans and put them in that situation and see it. I was always really excited about that, that possibility. And, you know, I got in through uh, sort of the acting side of things, mm -hmm. uh, which was an interesting process for me because I got into acting a little bit more because I was, um, I was actually homeschooled my entire life. Okay. And so when I went into high school for the first time, I was just sort of thrown into like, uh, kind of almost that mean girls, like, you know, uh, the jungle of like, what yeah. are all these people, all these different, um, you know, all these different personalities. And I was really interested in, in that and what motivated people to be certain ways and, um, and so I jumped into acting and, and speech early on in, in high school. And it was also a way for me to sort of like mask a lot of like anxiety that I had and just be able to like live in this character and be this other person. Um, you know, and then that I really got drawn in through that. And then that turned into, um, you know, the ability to create stories through a character. And I got really, that's where that kind of love um, came through as well. And I just stuck with, I stuck with acting. I loved it. I did it all through college. I did a bunch of independent films out of Austin, Texas. And it was when I was doing independent film uh, in front of the camera that I started getting interested in sort of like, oh, like again, that behind the scenes, like how, yeah. how can I be part of this process of like creating these really crazy stories um, with these, with, you know, these crazy different characters. And so um, I had the really unique opportunity to just jump in with both feet with, with the independent company that I was working with. The The director sort of lead in that company was a big John Hughes fan. So I did a mm. lot of sort of like John Hughesy romantic comedies, coming right. of age movies. Um, and then we got to dive into horror. Uh, we did a mockumentary about the film industry, which was one of my favorites because it's such a, you know, like sort of like a taboo subject. Um, yeah. And it was completely just about all the behind the scenes and like their their lives when they're not in front of their cameras, um, which I just thought was a really fun take on on that yeah. genre, obviously, because no one really cares about that. Um, but it was uh, it was, you know, that was that was really fun. Um, and so, yeah, over 10, you know, over five years, we did some feature films. A lot of them I, I got to produce. I got to direct a couple of short films, which is a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was a director of photography on a, on a short film, which I realized I, uh, as much as I love and respect director of photographies, I am not the one you want behind the camera. Um, and then I really also loved the development process a lot. Uh, and eventually one of our movies called Three References got into the Austin Film Festival. Um, and at that point, you know, independent film is tough. Like we all know yeah. that. Um, and it was at this point in time where the streamers were actually like just coming up, which is funny now because they're like, it's all a, a yeah. big crazy mess. And I decided to take all of the knowledge and, and things that I knew to Los Angeles and really figure out, you know, what's that next big step in distribution and trying to actually, you know, make films, which I felt right. like I had a pretty good handle on, but actually get them in front of audiences in a really, right. uh, in a real way. So I was lucky enough to move to Los Angeles. I, um, one of my first jobs was actually, I was a construction coordinator for Scouts versus Zombies. I don't know if you remember that mm. movie, but um, yes, it was, and it was like movie magic. 
Like yeah. I was in the middle of nowhere in Santa Clarita with a bunch of, um, you know, like construction guys, like rebuilding sets. And I was just like, you guys, this is amazing. Like, this is crazy yeah. that this is your job. Like, aren't y'all so, ex-, you know, and they were like, we would do this for a living. Like, why are you right. so excited? You know, I was like such a kid. Um, but that was, a, again, just like another like fantastic experience of like, this is so cool. Um, and, you know, like we're, we're building, we're building these crazy, crazy stories, you know, right. like putting so much work into them. Um, it, it was just really special. And so from that, I started, uh, I started an assistant position at a company called Rehab Entertainment. Um, I started working with John Hyde, who is a producer, um, and it was great because John and I both had that and still do have this, you know, we have kind of like what we call project ADD. We like so many different things like John's yeah. career spans music, live stage, you know, television to the eighties where he did flight of the navigator and short mm. circuit. Um, and then animation, you know, which was a huge part of my childhood that I, I literally loved animation, but I, did not ever think that I could be involved in it at all because I had yeah. no skills, right? no draw, like animation skills at all. So, um, and so, and then he also had just done tons of television and other things. And so we were a great team and we, uh, you know, I just had the unique opportunity to kind of jump in with both feet there as well. Um, and started putting a slate together with him and, and, you know, his background was, robust in what I was looking for, which was, you know, uh, financing and distributing films and television. So it was, it was a perfect spot to land. And yeah, we started building a slate in 2015. Um, he had short circuit and flight of the navigator from his sort of legacy projects. And we, uh, took both of those films flight of the navigator now sits at, um, Disney plus with Bryce Dallas Howard directing, which is literally a dream. Yeah. Um, pretty amazing. Yeah. Right. And, um, and then short circuit is actually um, with a company called spyglass entertainment mm -hmm. um, or spyglass media group. And they are um, longtime friends of John, John and Gary Barber go way back. So uh, that one's in the process of development right now. Yeah. It's, it's, w was there any period? Cause it sounds like literally you like, kind of stepped onto a slide <laughs> and then just kept sliding and like picked up tons of momentum. Like, was there, was there a period in the beginning where you were like, okay, well, this acting stuff is fun, but that can't be a career or was it going into it with intent, even in, you know, even in high school going like, okay, how can I take a step to go toward this? Like, was it, or was it kind of like, oh shoot, things are happening. I'm going to keep following this thread. Following the energy. Yeah. So when I moved out to Los Angeles, um, yeah, I was still, I was still doing the acting thing. I was in a couple short films. I had, um, I had gotten an agent and, you know, it was one of those things where I had been in a, a, a very like, almost like a troupe, an acting troupe for so long in Austin that when I came to Los Angeles, like the shine of, of the, of, of the acting world was sort of gone. And I always told myself, like, as I go through my, you know, producing career, like I would be able to create those opportunities for myself, which I've been able to do. Um, but yeah, it was one of those things where I had gone to Los Angeles to learn more about the production and producing side. Yeah. And I had that opportunity, like, so, you know, so immediate. I was like, I just got to do it. I got to yeah. jump in with both feet. Well, and so the acting thing was kind of fell to the wayside. Right. But I still very much, uh, very much consider myself an actor still in a lot of ways. Um, I'm kind of diving back into voice acting now. Um, you know, it's still, it's still something I do. And it's that I project ADD, often. you like the showbiz yeah. period. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is what's interesting to me because, you know, I, I mean, I've devoured as much as I can about, you know, filmmaking and, and I've talked to a lot of different people now. And, um, my first interview was with Scott Rosenfeld, who's a producer and did like Home Alone mm -hmm. and like, you know, mm -hmm. just a little movie like Home Alone. Just, and, you uh, know, little guy. But it was go. interesting talking with him because I still had in my mind this idea that like cartoons and like 
even Hollywood is kind of presented, which is like the producer is like smoking a cigar, feet up on the desk, like doesn't care about the art, but just like, you know, here's a thousand dollars, you know, for this, you know, Mm -hmm. here's 10,000 for this. But then I start talking to people like Scott or like yourself who are coming at it with a lot of love for either writing or acting or the creative side of things. Um, Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like in a production role? Because you are in the business side of things a little bit more. Um, How do you get to express that creative side while also making sure that you're coming in, you know, under budget and making your Thinking about the bottom line and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, Yes. So it's funny that you say that because I was just listening to a a Kevin Smith give an interview and he was talking about we have entered sort of this new era in the industry where creative execs and executive executive producers used to be what you just described, or it was just like, oh yeah, go oh, do it. I don't care. It was a business opportunity. Um, business Movies are big, you know, let's right. do it. And now you have writers and artists who are now in those roles. Um, so yes, yeah, so I mean, one of my one of the best things about my job is working with creators, working with writers now working with artists um, and producers who are in animation uh, as well. You know, my first, the first project that actually went into distribution uh, was Harriet the Spy, which is an animated series. And it was my first time getting to give notes and creative input on artwork and what that world was going to look like and talking about like the Easter eggs we were going to put in it, you know, like Louise Fitzhugh, who's the author of Harriet the Spy, like there's a little mural and like one of the the backgrounds of her. And it was very, we wanted to do that. And it was, it was a process um, that we went through to make sure we put it exactly in the right spot. You know, all of the character designs, background designs. Um, one of my favorite things about, you know, with that whole process was like, we had weekly design meetings where we just got to talk to the artists talk about the designs and that's um on my animated projects that's a big part of the creative right is thinking about the style um and it's been a great learning process for me I mean I like I said I don't come from animation so I rely a lot on our producer on that which was uh, Sydney Clifton who's an amazing animation producer um and the artist you know like I think now more than ever like people are realizing we need to listen to the actual artists on things. Yeah. Um, weird. <laughs> you know, that has been way more, it's been so fulfilling in a way that I never even thought it would be yeah. because I never thought I would work in animation. Um, and then on, you know, the, the live action side, you know, I have a movie. Um, I have a movie that I'm working on that's based on uh, a public domain story called the yellow wallpaper. And that came out of, I really wanted to do a movie that focused on a woman who was really, who was pregnant, who was really nervous about it for lots of different reasons. And I wanted it to feel maybe a little bit like the unborn or, you know, one of those like old horror movies or like the brood is another one that kind of taps into that, but I really wanted it to be female centric. And I just started talking, going out, talking to writers about you know, a lot of female writers in this case about like their experience with it, what they would do. And, um, you know, found a writer who was very passionate about a, a take that she had on something. And we just kind of built it from there. And now, you know, fingers crossed, it's in the the hands of the negotiating gods that that's going to get the script's going to get financed. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's one of those instances where it was really cool to have an idea to have you know, something I really wanted to put into a film and, and find someone who could do the thing yeah. and then we could creatively work together. Right. So I'm always creatively working with, uh, with writers and filmmakers. I'm doing notes on pitch pages. Um, you know, creating decks is a big part of my job or overseeing the creation of decks, which is great because it's, it's almost like, you know, a little mini like pre-production of like, right what's this going to look like what's this going to feel like what's the style and like you immediately know when you start going back and forth with your other teammates like where there's disconnect it's like okay we cannot mix those two things like what are we you know what are we looking at um and that's really exciting too because I feel like it gives you starts giving you a cohesiveness for the actual movie right 
um, before you go out and try to try to sell it to someone um, who's who's going to be already like five steps behind where you're at because they haven't been part of that development process. Right. So. Um, so yeah, that's really how I stay in the creative side. I'm just deeply involved in all of my projects creatively. Yeah. Um, you know, from every stage from, you know, I might read a book or uh, a webtoon that I love and start, you know, looking at, at how I might want to would redevelop that, you know, talking to my yeah. producing partner about how we would redevelop that. Um, and then just starting to talk to whoever those rights owners are. Um, and you know, sometimes they want to be involved with the creative process as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, they want to be involved with searching for what creative voice is going to come on board and actually sort of write the thing and craft the thing for the adaptation for television or for film. Um, and that's another unique part of my job too, is I've done a lot of adaptations. Uh, that was also something I didn't know yeah. that I would be doing, you know, from Harriet the Spy to, right. Um, we do have a couple of children's books, Kissing Hand, Colors of Us, um, and then Flight of the Navigator and, and Short Circuit. And that's yeah. a whole nother layer of creativity and development because, you know, I know people aren't thrilled about a lot of the remakes and reimaginings that are going on right. and you yeah. don't want to make people angry and not give them something, give them something that they don't want, you know, so it's always, um, trying to go to the core of what that creative, uh, what, what, what people love about a project, yeah. you know? Um, is, that, is that kind of the approach with like, say Harriet the spy, you know, because you know, it's the first, I think it's the first ever animated mm -hmm. version of it. Right. It Cause is. it's, there's been plenty of live action. Right. Things, I grew but, up on the 90s, the Nick, the Nickelodeon movie. And I right, loved that's, it. Yeah. When I think of it, that's what comes to mind. But then right. looking at, you know, the one on Apple TV, like it's a really beautiful art style, like in, you know, and I'm always happy whenever I see animation, that's not just the generic 3d, right. you know, right. um, I love seeing those that look like you're stepping into a storybook. And, um, but when you're approaching somebody like Harriet the Spy or you know, some of these other remakes, do you just find one thing to really pin into and say, this is the approach you want to take? Is it, are you, like how do you how do you decide i guess what to evolve because we've mm -hmm. seen harriet the spy we've seen some of these other characters versus like what do we leave here like this is a core part of what makes this property this property yeah that's a great question on harriet the spy there were a ton of conversations about that um so you know it's it's based off a book from 1964 that you know was banned in a lot of places because it was about a, a little girl who ultimately like her goal was she wanted to be a writer being a spy is, is only part of that process, you know, like being a spy is because she needs to know everything to be a writer and to know everything you have to be a spy. And what we found with a lot of the other adaptations um, and what we really loved about the actual source material in the book, the book is about her journey being a writer and sort of, it's a coming of age for an 11 year old girl. Um, she has to learn a lot of tough lessons in, you know, a, a very small amount of time, she loses her best friend, which is her nanny. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's cause it's set in 1964. So, uh, she's gets her notebook, which is full of all of like a bunch of like terrible things she's written down about people, which are her private thoughts, which everyone's entitled to. Um, but it gets stolen and they read it. And it's a really difficult question of like, <sighs> I have to, do I, why do I have to apologize when these are my thoughts that were supposed to be secret to me, but now other people have seen them. Why do I have to apologize? And it's, it's, you know, it's a very interesting and almost very like, it's the first time this girl has like experienced this kind of complexity. And what we wanted to do is really like hone in on, on that piece of, of the book and the source material is like how this girl goes from sort of seeming kind of like kind of, she's like a little mean like she's a little crass like she's unapologetic and then really see how she grows up and really sees how she starts to change you know and also appreciate herself but know that she has to sort of change in certain ways, um, you know, to move forward after this specific event happens. One of the cool things that that happened is we realized it had never been animated before. And so 
that would allow us to go back to 1964 New York, which was freaking beautiful. And it would allow us to also get inside of her mind a little bit yeah. because what you never have seen from Harriet and why I think a lot, it feels, you know, I think a little crass and why no one ever wanted to really go there in an adaptation, especially in live action is because you kind of just have a girl who seems kind of mean maybe right in a certain way if you do it uh, without showing like what the inner workings of her mind are. And so in our show, you have a lot of seeing like what's going on in this girl's head. Like she has a wild imagination, you know, she's um, at one point she's like in a spaceship with cats, you know, like she just wants to be alone. And so she goes and like babysets a bunch of cats and she just imagines herself. I think it's, it's aligned with like the first, um, the first woman going up into space. And so she's thinking about that too. And she's just like, you know, imagining herself in that same position. And then she comes out of it realizing like maybe being alone is not what she needs. Um, right. um, and so we try to talk about, you know, deep, meaningful aspects of the human experience through the perspective of this like really goofy, you know, kind of wild 12 year old, 11 year old girl that was, a, and she's always wanted and always wants to be a writer. And I think that's like what we, when you were talking about pinpointing something, yeah. It's always comes down to that. And like at the end of every episode, she is digesting everything that she went through and she's writing it down and she's growing from it and she's growing as a writer and as a person. Um, and that was really important to us because Louise Fitzhugh was, that's what her original story was about. It wasn't about, you know, like a, like a spy girl, you know, which is where most adaptations have kind of Zone yeah, in. and for you know, I get it. I get the reasoning for it. Um, mm -hmm. it's much more, you know, it's much more easy to sell toys, spy toys, you know, um, mm -hmm. than it is like to sell like notebooks and pens and mm -hmm. lensless glasses, you know, like all these quirky <laughs> things that yeah. she does. But, um, I think our adaptation is truly special because we did go back to that source material, and I, I, I hope Louise Fitzhugh would be would be happy with it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious for so many of these projects. I mean, you're working with a lot that are going to streamers like Disney plus, you know, or, or yeah. Apple TV. Um, you know, how does that affect what projects you take? Is there more freedom because, you know, there's more easy ways to find audiences through those platforms. Is it harder because you don't have that box office money coming in? Like when you're looking and trying to find projects, like, do you see that as like a positive thing or kind of a, a negative thing that, you know, it's kind of diluted a little bit. It's a little wild, especially right now. I mean, right now, especially with you, all the HBO stuff happening oh, and people are have, all the questions you know, happening. Yeah. I mean, in the last five years, we've, you've had mass merge. You've had a Disney merger. Mm -hmm. All of the streamers in the last three years have popped up with their yeah. own, with their, you know, with their own stream, all the studios have popped up with their own streamers. Um, you've got all the major mergers, you know, you've got, you've got people who are scared of losing their job, you know, uh, these executives at these major companies. And so selling right now is really tricky because you, the studio system is, is really risk averse right now. Um, you know, I think things are kind of coming back in terms of box office, but it's, you know, it's very much like a question of if you're going to have a movie that goes into theaters, like. Is it going to is it going to be able to compete with something like a Marvel movie? Yeah, is it a is it a semi guaranteed successful property right. that we know? Yeah, I mean, what was the Michael the Michael Bay ambulance movie? Yeah, um, died. Yeah, dead on Which is wild. The theater. <laughs> I mean, just... it's like you know, it's Michael Bay. You know, yeah. you're like, uh, so. Yes, it is. It is a wild time. I don't even at this point like. And the only project we have that I would, that I, I'm like, that's a box office, like a theatrical movie is Profit, which is based on a Rob Liefeld uh, comic book IP. Yeah. Sam Hargrave is, is attached to direct that. And he's an amazing director. He comes from a stunt coordinator, coordinator world. Um, and Jake Gyllenhaal is attached. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's big enough where I feel like it could rival, you know, those, those bigger comic book movies. Right. And still be unique in, in its own way, because um, you also don't want it to be the same thing. So it's like this very weird, it's this very strange balance that you're you're having to think through, and also just be creative and trying to develop something good, you know. And yeah. like you're also thinking about this other, the money side. Um, 
but mainly like now I, I don't, I don't think about movies really going into the theater. Yeah. You know, I really you almost go in saying what streamer can we sell this to? What streamer can we sell this to? Could we do this independently? I mean, independent, you know, the independent um, financing model is, was shattered, pretty shattered long ago, but it's, you know, there's still ways to make it work. Um, you're looking at, you know, the cheaper the budgets right now, the better, unless you have like a grandiose IP. Um, you know, uh, I'm not out pitching a TV series with the budget that Lord of the Rings have, unless it's, you know, something like Lord of the Rings. Right. Um, you know, it just doesn't, no one wants to take that risk. So a lot of like five to 10 million and under movies. Um, I, I love horror. Um, you know, Same, the, yeah. yeah, like the I Baba mean... Dukes. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, like Relic, Babadook, Saint yeah. Maud. Um, those kind of movies uh, are, are ones that I love anyway. That mm -hmm. definitely can be done. You know, that ten to five. Yeah. Um, and then in you know the kids space, those budgets and animation. You know, those those can be really small. You can make them work for really yeah. small. And then you have some streamers who are who are spending a lot more money on that kind of content. Mm -hmm. And so if you have, you know, like in the, in the case of Harriet, you know, we knew um, that Apple was really looking for really quality, beautiful, um, mm -hmm. you know, visually unique content and our vision aligned with that completely. And we were able to, get a, a pretty decent budget to do that yeah. um, and worked with a great, I have to just say uh, Titmouse Animation is a, a fantastic animation studio that we worked with who made, created all that hmm. um, beautiful artwork. So yeah, it's definitely, you know, if it's something you never want to make, you know, I hate the word like, but well, we need to, we need to find something cheap to make. Right. Um, but you know, there are ways to make things on a shoestring budget. I come from right. that world. Yeah. Um, that well, would great and have a style, you know, like, yeah, that, that's the thing that seems to be the conversation now because it shifts a lot where it's like, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I, I just don't like I look at the budgets on some of these films and then you like see, I mean, e even bigger budget, lower budget movie, you know, like when you're looking at, uh, I mean, all the Robert Eggers movies that he's doing with the A24, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. like he doesn't have Lord of the Rings budget for the Northman, you know, but the Northman looks really freaking good. You know, yeah. like it's, it's um, so I, I don't know. And even some of the, so the smaller studios that were doing a lot of low budget, you know, lower budget movies, like they're starting to be more successful and then taking on bigger budget projects. And it's like, who is going to finance the new filmmakers that have a really good idea. That's, you know, visually interesting or, or mm -hmm. approaches it differently. Um, and it seems like streaming is kind of a, a golden opportunity for a lot of that stuff, but also again, there's so much noise out there. It's like, it seems like you lose something and gain something either way you go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's challenging. It's threading a needle and I feel for all of those, you know, creators out there who are trying to tap into you know, what these streamers and studios are saying that they need that, by the way, changes every few months, you know, right. like the needs are always continually changing because they're going off of, you know, real time data now um, and loads of it. Um, but that are still trying to uh, trying to have some, you know, new creative ideas and take that next step, um, you know, in their in their in their career and you know, do what some of the, you know, really awesome, like the David Lynch's and the Cronenberg's and right. like those very strange filmmakers got to do, you know, yeah. where, you know, Eraserhead is such like an art house, you know, art house film. You're just like, what? Yeah. Um, and I love it. But then it's totally, you know, you then you watch, you know, you watch Twin Peaks and or you just even just listen to David Lynch and you're like, what, is, how did this guy like manage to do this, you know, right. and, and get trusted with, with that budget? Like that doesn't seem like that happens that much anymore. Right. And there are just certain people now who get those opportunities. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're seeing Jordan Peele kind of get that where he's Jordan getting, Peele is definitely getting that, you know, yeah. who's, um, 
yeah, it's it's there's a few that are that are getting that. I that mean, Ari Aster, you know, like just quirky, weird, where you're like, a studio saw this and really, you know, released this, you know, that that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it takes a lot of work for the, you know, and I get it, I get why it takes a lot of work um, for those creators to to get. Well, it's not like Jordan Peele trust. started with Get Out, you know, <laughs> he's right? Been, exactly, he's been working he's for been, a long time, know, decades, you know, some of these guys. Um, you know, I hope that, and I think what is going to happen is, you know, we're seeing like the streamer bubble mm-hmm. um, sort of come to to a head, and w- you know, even though right now it's like it is, it is a trying time and a challenging time to be out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with these kinds of major changes come these opportunities. You know, everyone talks about like Netflix two thousand eighteen. You know, what's what's when is that going to happen again? You know, where you have you know, either a studio or a few studios who are, um, or, or independence or whatever, whatever system kind of starts coming into play, a financial model that starts coming to play that makes, uh, that creates more opportunity for taking more risks, uh, with films. I think technology is something that's like going to change the the scope of that as well um you know everyone talks about the led screens mandalorian um you know that that's that that's a game changer you know uh you know engines like unreal um or anybody who has a proprietary engine like that that's starting to create content within that that's a game changer you know that's going to be i I think a big uh help the shift into this next wave of filmmaking and and opportunity that people have well it's wild like um like mandalorian you know it because i was i was telling my wife we were watching i was like it's crazy to take for granted that this exists because we had we had just watched smallville like a, a year or two before like rewatched it which i i love smallville yeah. um but i was like it's crazy because like the effects then were like good for tv like it still was like there was no mm-hmm joking that it was going to be like oh this looks just like what you'd see in a superman movie but now you watch like mandalorian or you watch obi-wan like it looks like a star wars movie right it's a tv show and the fact Mm -hmm. that with i mean a fraction of the budget you know like a star wars movie so it is really interesting like the ability to take people to literally whole different worlds with these like led screens and with like this real-time lighting and like all this kind of crazy technology um yeah it's 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 crazy just how much that's changed over the last couple of years. Like mm-hmm. even the last, I mean, last six, seven months, how much that's changed. I just watched a moonfall and that movie is crazy, but I was just like, you know, it's a lot of stuff I've never seen before. Like they went, <laughs> right. They went full throttle into these, all the effects you could possibly do. It was a, you know, pandemic movie, I'm pretty sure. And mm-hmm. like, you know, they just, you had the moon scraping skyscrapers, you know, it's just like, right. What, um, things you could never possibly even think of doing, you know, um, yeah. at, at some point, uh, say what you will about what, about the whole movie as a whole, but I, I love seeing this, you know, I love disaster films. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. I love, I love all that stuff. So I'm yeah. always interested, like Roland Emmerich's name is on it. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, let's I, check I, it I out. Watch it. Yeah, we'll let's it. go for it. Yeah, no, that's super, that's super cool. Um, well, I do want to I do want to ask a little bit just on the relationship side because that is such a big part of this. Um, and you know, obviously, form a relationship with someone like you know John Hyde, like trying to find talent for your projects. Like, I mean, tell me a little bit about that because you're coming into you came into LA from Texas. You know, like I'm guessing no connections initially. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, how did you initially build that relationship with? like John start actually kind of establishing your footprint in LA. Cause I think a lot of people have either really good ideas or they have a really good network, but there's not a lot of crossover between the two a lot of times. Mm So um, what's your advice to people who are looking to build relationships with people who are established and are, you know, can kind of help guide and mentor through the process of navigating that new space? Yeah. I mean, I, I was incredibly lucky in how I sort of uh, got got into rehab entertainment and how I met John, um, my roommate at the time, uh, who I had met actually doing independent films in Austin. She was leaving the role of the assistant at the company. And, she, you know, I had been in L.A. at like six months and didn't really have a, a, a day-to-day 
uh, job. And I was like, I definitely need cash. So great. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Um, and then I, and I had never really asked her about her, about her job. Uh, and when she started describing like what the role was and who the producer was, I was just like, oh, this could be really like a really good opportunity. And so when I went in there and I met John and, you know, John is, um, you know, just a veteran producer. So I was very overwhelmed. I was produced like, to UHF. If I mean, you did yeah. nothing else, that's, that's enough for me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like having heart palpitations and, and, um, but I just, you know, he, he really just asked me about what, you know, obviously like where I came from, what I wanted to do, what I had done. And he was, he was just really, I think, impressed at sort of my, um, my ability to stay an independent film for as long as I did at the level that it, that it was, um, just because I, I loved it and I loved the company and I wanted to make, you know, I had the goal of making films and I did that. And then I kind of moved on. And I think he just, he really saw the, the passion that I had. And he also was very much looking for someone to take the reins of the company. Um, you know, he still wants, he's still actively involved. Uh, we're in the office every day, but I was like, yeah, I don't know what that means exactly, but yes, I will, I will jump in and I will, I will do this. Um, and so I think going back to your question of what I would tell people when they're trying, when they're going to LA is, is, you know, doing your, doing your research, uh, about these, you know, if you, there are specific people that they're trying to meet doing their research, a lot of the times, like I spend sometimes hours, like going through Instagram, going through social, like seeing who they're connected to. Like, is it possible that I know anyone like from college even, or, you know, like just whatever little connect you can find, um, you know, and surrounding yourself with people who are also after the same thing you're after. I think that's a big one. And you move to LA, like you're so or any big city, when you move anywhere where you're alone, you're, you're, you know, you're desperate to like find your group, to find your community. Like you really want that. Um, and I think it's important for people early on to have sort of a fine tooth comb, because if, if you're, you know, if you get caught up in the, in the, in a group that's not aligned with what you want, like you're going to get distracted. Um, it's easy to do that. Um, you know, and so I think, really trying to find that group that wants the same thing. Not that you can't like, not that you can't have other friends who aren't in the industry and all that, but really like focusing on whatever that thing is that you want to do. Just remembering to like stay on that trajectory as much as possible. Surround yourself with those people who want the same things who are also rooting for you. Right. Um, right. Not just competing with you. Not yeah. just competing with you. Um, is it, nobody in LA does that though. There's nobody oh, that's just there for themselves. There's no competition here. No, no. Everyone's just, it's, it's, yeah, everyone's, uh, everyone's great. Um, yes. People who root for you. Um, or at least knowing, uh, and figuring out the people who maybe aren't rooting for you. And if you can still use them for their contacts, do it, <laughs> you know, like, um, it is, it is competitive out here. I am not generally, I would not consider myself a competitive person. Um, but you know, we, you have to find opportunities where they, where you, where mm -hmm. you can't, um, yeah. but there are great people out here. Um, there's also now, you know, it's so, especially after the pandemic with zoom, it's so easy to mm -hmm. like, even if you don't know anyone and you want to send a cold email to someone and just say, Hi, I'm so, especially like if you're, you know, working on a film or like if you have something that you can show um, or if you're just reaching out even to, to say like, I'm just getting started. I have a series of questions I would like to ask you, would you, can you, could you take 15 minutes, you know, and answer you like, I think people are much more open to that now because right. they can jump on a zoom. I would just say to the people who are reaching out and doing that, make sure you have those like specific yeah. questions. Like, Can I make pick sure... your brain? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Like make sure you have like really specific things. You know, it's like I said, it's always good to really research this person mm -hmm. and dig into something that they're interested in. Um, 
you know, it's, it's a freaking old book, but like how to, how to win friends and influence people mm -hmm. is like, read that book, just read that book and then take from that. And it's kind of, you know, it's human nature. Like just try to find a connection with someone, um, you know, about something that they, that they like or where they came from. Anytime I'm talking to like an executive, you know, I do a lot of cold calling to other production companies and things, and I will look at where they're from. If we have friends in common, you know, if they have a, a public Instagram, like what food they like, where they like to go, like it feels stalkery, but <laughs> it's a way to just immediately connect with, right. with them on a level um, that I think used to be a lot harder because you didn't have all of these resources. Um, oh. You know, people know where I'm from. They know. I meet a lot of Texans. I meet a lot of people from Austin. They're like, Hey, like, um, yeah. you know, and that's an immediate like relationship now mm -hmm. without having to do anything. Cause I think when, one thing that I learned early on is I would go in, you know, cause I was like super young and like got this, and had this amazing opportunity with John. And I was just like, hi, like let's work together. You know? And it was like, Whoa, like, you know, take a step, just have a connection and a, and a relationship with someone projects collaborate collaboration will come when it comes right trying to sort of like force it doesn't doesn't work you know if you're a writer director more of a a creator specific creator like you might have that um but i would like try to just have a connection and a relationship with these people first before like going mm -hmm. into a pitch like don't jump on the zoom with them and ask questions and then go well i have this yeah while you're have here this idea yeah. while you're here like they are gonna die inside you're gonna um, hate the end of this podcast i've got such a great no i'm just kidding my pitch deck is right <laughs> i'm just kidding. <laughs> you're like i have to go um, like, oh well here we are um, well no yeah. I, I i love that old adage of like dig your well before you're thirsty um yeah. you know and it's it is i think there's a lot of people who build connections with this agenda of like oh, right. i got this thing exactly. and it's what I love when I've talked, you know, and there's certain people like, you know, that I've met that are like that, but I've also talked to a lot where it is cool. Like I, I go back, you know, podcasting has been my connection tool to a lot of different people. And it is cool, you know, looking back and going like, oh, that person knows who I am now. You know, there's mm -hmm. some connection point there, even though like, you know, I probably 90% of people that I talk to, like, it will never be a working relationship. It's never going to be me reaching out with a pitch but you get to at least meet a really cool person. And if that's your goal going into the conversation, you set yourself up for success in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think I, that was a big lesson for a lot of people through the pandemic. And now with the industry being a little, a little crazy, um, you're, 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 there are a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of people with burnout right now who are trying to like reconnect with themselves creatively, who are trying to like find that balance again of what is, what is work? What is my life? Like, um, you know, so if you are someone who's out trying to find people to talk to, it's probably really actually easy to get them right now because they do have more time on their hands and they're trying to like disconnect a little bit. But again, I would just say like, don't hit them with a lot of like, don't hit them with a lot of like questions of, or pitches and mm -hmm. ideas, you know, just getting to talk to them as more of a, of a, of a person. Yeah. Um, it's like a it, human being would be yeah, as a human yeah. being. Yeah. And then also like the other piece of advice is when you are talking to some people, you know, some people are really jaded mm -hmm. and they will, it will sound like super downery. Like as much as I talk about the industry being risk averse right now and wild, I also know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you know, this is what this industry always is. Um, it's going to be fine. It's just finding what the new, the new system is going to look like what the new ecosystem is going to look like. But mm -hmm. if you're talking to someone and they're like super jaded and, and it's a downer conversation, just like leave the business side of the conversation and just yeah. go into like basic human stuff you know <laughs> like whatever right. that is and in other interests and then you know maybe like maybe there was something beneficial about that advice mm -hmm. that they said but like try not to take on the you know if, if it was a downer conversation like try don't try don't take on the negative energy and be like oh, sure no, like what have I done right um it's 
you know, it's going to be okay. Everyone's just in their own place with what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we transition into the random round section, I did want to ask you, um, what are you most excited about? Because you're working on a like a million things, <laughs> like your your list mm-hmm. of your bio is just mm-hmm. like a book. Um, mm-hmm. You know, what project are you most excited for? Like, what do you, I know you like doing live action, you like animation, like what it, what's on the horizon that you're like, this is the the biggest thing that I'm just pumped for people to to see or to to get moving. I mean, I think it's um I think right now it's probably Fly the Navigator, just because mm. now that we have Bryce on board. Yeah. Um I'm excited I'm excited to see her do a feature because she's yeah. clearly and we're the first a killer we're director. Be the first if we if we get yeah. it can get it going. I'm like, she's gonna get spooked. Everyone wants her, like, please, like yeah. uh uh let's go. But uh but you know that one. Um, you know, we have a, we had a script for it. It's got to go through some rewrites now that she's on board, but, um, it's a really, it's a, it's a really great script. It's going to be a really great story. It's going to be, um, you know, it's, it's super emotional, but also very aspirational. I mean, it's, you know, it's fly the navigator. It, it, you're in a spaceship. Yeah. Um, she's from the star Wars universe. Like, it's just, mm-hmm. it's going to be super cinematic. Um, but it's also going to have some really cool characters, really some really interesting, like I think different t- turns on relationships, some relationships we don't get to normally see, mm. um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I think it's going to be moving, you know, quickly, fingers crossed. I think we'll, <laughs> I think we'll be really getting into it at the top of next year. Um, but yeah, I think that one, is that one's been super special because mm-hmm. it's one of the first that I started working on. Um, and, and you know, it's been five, six years in development, yeah. which is how these things roll often yeah. and seeing that come to fruition and, and sort of having now having the director on board and, um, having the studio really excited. Uh, it makes me really excited for what it's going to become and, and for everyone to, to see it. And then I'm also very excited about um, you know, a completely different spectrum of the slate, the independent film that we're doing um, that's based on on the uh, on the yellow wallpaper. I'm excited for that as well. Um, I read I read a book about um, like how women have been silenced historically in the church, mm-hmm. and the book opens with this story of the yellow wallpaper. I'd never heard it before, but but I went and searched out the story. And when I was reading, I was like, this has like all the visual cues where you're like, you could see the shots, like why you're like the peeling away at the wallpaper. Like, so I'm really excited to see how that turns out. And I think it could be a really cool, scary <laughs> kind of mm-hmm. isolated story. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in that as well. And uh, seeing how that develops, that's going to be a really cool one as well. Yeah. Very, very excited. Let me go ahead and move us here into uh, the random round side of things. The random round, I ask everybody these questions that comes on the show. I'm curious to hear your answers. Number one, what do you think personally is the best decade of film history? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. That's a great question. Um, Not not the 2000s that's for sure uh probably really? no not 2000 to 2004 was like a great <laughs> period of the best cinema history. like by far the best um you know i think the 70s and 80s were pretty great um also i mean big fan of the 50s um you had a lot of like change coming in in the 50s hmm. any time any decade where it, there was like a monumental tech change yeah. like i think we're entering that now um hmm. I, you know, arcane Mandalorian, all these new methods of, of animating and producing, um, you know, but, uh, you know, like I said, I'm a big fan of like the, the Cronenbergs and the Lynches and body horror in general. And I feel like there was a lot of, a lot of, um, really cool styles bubbling up, uh, in, in special effects and makeup and things in that yeah. time, you know, the thing, um, amazing movie. Yeah, there's uh, always or, these periods where things go like it's very tame like the early 50s yes. versus the end of the 50 and yes. i i actually think we're kind of getting into that period again where yes. we've had the superhero thing has been going mm-hmm. and now like it's not so much horror but like 
blonde that they're pushing for an X rating. Um, Damien Chazelle's new movie is supposed to be also, I think, pushing toward mm-hmm. an X direction. So it's interesting that you're seeing this like kind of push back against like the family Hollywood blockbuster and into right. this, you know, I prefer when that goes into horror, like we mentioned the early 2000s, but like coming off the 90s going into Saw, you know, like I like those reactionary mm-hmm. periods yes. of time. Yes, that's exactly um, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, we have the technology yeah. too, changing Mandalorian TV. I mean, there's a yeah, lot the, the ability, <laughs> all of the things that you can do now and the quality that you have that you couldn't do before, you right. know, that's really, that's really starting to roll. Um, but yeah, there are, you know, especially I feel like in TV, which is always sort of reactionary and always mm-hmm. kind of trying to be edgy um, where you just, you know, I like seeing things that I've never seen before. I'm just like, oh my God, they went there. You yeah. know, um, right. Once upon a time in Hollywood is like also one of my big favorites, mm-hmm. like the the idea of like changing history and it being a little bit over the top, but also very like emotional and like touching mm-hmm. on, um, you know, there's things culturally that we really that we oddly care about. You know, it's yeah. weird. Like everyone understands that movie. You know, yeah. everyone thinks about that moment in history of like, God, that really sucked be really cool if that didn't happen also it could be this really badass like crazy movie right Um, exactly you know uh yeah i think uh i think you're right i think it's the reactionary you know let's push the boundaries let's let's shake it off like let's you know i I really like the the show succession when kieran culkin Mm. is like take off your shirt disrupt disrupt you know (laughs) right i think that's where we're at yeah love it um what is a movie that uh fans of yours would be surprised that you enjoy you Maybe. seem pretty eclectic, so this might know, not be like, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I lo- one of my favorite movies that I quote so much that I actually share this uh, the love of it with my sister, uh, and we we literally will text daily quotes about it. Uh, the Imposters, which was Stanley mm. Tucci who directed it. It's him. He also acts in it. It's him and Oliver Platt. Uh, it's about two starving actors who um, they they go to a play. It's like completely petty. The reason they go to this play, they insult the main, they're at a bar afterwards. They insult the main actor and you know, it's a comedy. It's a ridiculous, like physical comedy. They end up on a, on a boat in the middle of the ocean where this guy is that they insulted and he's trying to catch them and, and they're going into people's rooms and it's like Tony Shalhoub, um, Steve Buscemi is in it. Hmm. Um, just this, uh, Alfred Molina, like, this incredible cast of people who are and it was done I think in the 90s but it's set in the 50s Mm. it's just so random it's a random movie but it's so good like these I mean Stanley Tucci and Oliver Platt you know like that's 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 like I say for me like I'm just like got (laughs) it Stanley Tucci okay sold let's go good yeah I mean that one's a weird one just because I I, people a lot of people don't know about it yeah Um, I've never heard of it it's on my list this is this show also exists to fuel my watch list which has grown (laughs) so so huge I think it's fantastic it's weird it's really weird um but it's like just I love it uh, uh and i highly recommend it it's my goal to like rev it up so much and in, in pop culture that they do a sequel that'd be awesome bryce dallas out. howard directing i think so yeah Perfect. i think so bring and just bring back tucci and platt like just they don't it doesn't need to be a reboot it just it needs to be a direct sequel i'm i'm 100 percent sold stanley right. tucci is always great and um i just watched the lovely bones this year oh. and i was like how do they make Stanley Tucci creepy? <laughs> it's like, it kind of, kind of hurt Ooh. me deeply to be like, upsetting. Yeah. yeah. What of your projects do you think is the best representation of you as a creator? Mm. Hmm. I, I would say probably the, 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 in, the indie, the yellow wallpaper, you know, that mm. came from a place of like a deep, uh, a, a deep desire to talk about something that's really, that's honestly just really can be really effed up. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the difficulties and complications of being a mom of, and all of the horror elements of what it does to you in society, what it does to your body. Um, you know, it comes from a really, uh, a really deep emotional place. I don't mm. know if I ever want to have children and I'm deeply afraid of it. And so I've, 
I went out to, you know, why not crack that fear open and just see what comes out of it, you yeah. know? Um, and I think that's, uh, at least for me right now, I think in life, like I'm really interested in like diving into some weird, creepy places. Um, but also I like the vagueness of there not being a bad guy in, mm -hmm. and in this story, there's not, you could say in the short story, the bad guy, her husband. Um, but I think in the adaptation, it's sort of, we wanted to make it a little bit more vague on what is it about this that makes it so terrifying? Yeah. Um, it's not really any one person's fault. It's a lot of different things going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just comes from a really deep emotional place. And I think that's where I like to create from right now. Um, you know, that being said, again, going back to, you know, fly to the navigator and even something like profit, I, I love those big, as yeah. you know, aspirational or even, you know, they're, neither of them are a disaster movie, but there's definitely elements of that kind of terror of like, there's something that is coming that's bigger than anything you've ever seen before and what's that going to mean for humanity or maybe these particular set of characters as a whole yeah. um so that was another long answer to to a, to a question <laughs> this is why i always move these back because they're always yeah. but they're always i think the best answers there there's i'm always curious to hear answers on these um yeah. If you were given the green light, we talked about remakes. If you were given the green light to remake any film, what would you choose and why? Oh, God. To remake it. Um, gosh. Um, I mean, this goes back. This is a little, maybe it's too aligned with yellow wallpaper, but... Uh, maybe something like the brood hmm. or the unborn, like, again, like going back to those older pregnancy horrors yeah, and just like adding a little bit to, I mean, the brood is like a beautiful, I mean, it's Cronenberg. He's a beautiful filmmaker. Um, but, uh, you know, I think coming at it from like some, maybe some different perspectives or updating it, mm -hmm. you know, a mod, I like doing modern takes on, those older movies because the yeah. fear is the same just it kind of looks different today um yeah that's what and I then we get bummed out how much looks the same exactly even though <laughs> we've been yeah exactly like I oh, these I, issues I, still exist from like, 1954 you know it's like yeah it's creepy it's weird you know. to think it's weird to think of uh of that but you don't see it you know sometimes it's hard to see unless you lay it out yeah. um you know and i think I'm trying to think of any others that scanners is also really mm. a really good one, but I don't, I don't know. That one's so good. I don't know if you'd want to reimagine it. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Last question I ask everybody, what's the best piece of advice you would give to an aspiring filmmaker who is listening to this? If you had to give one piece of advice. I think being really patient and persistent um, in your endeavors and uh, and being by being patient, I also mean being patient with yourself as well. Um, you know, there are days where it feels like it's never going to happen. Um, you move through it, you know, you can't ever let that, that settle in and stop you from doing something. Even if you're shooting weird shit in your garage or in your backyard, keep doing it. You know, yeah. it, it's, we're in a time now where you could put it on the internet. Someone could see it and go, Hey, this is really interesting. Like let's, you know, let's flesh this out or possibilities really are endless um, more than ever, I think today. And it's just being true to what you want to do. Oh. I think being, just being, I know it's like a, being authentic is, is such a catchphrase now. Yeah. But it's definitely something to it of just, you know, doing, working on what you want to work on. What, what is your, what is your stamp? What is it you want to do and staying true to that? And, um, you know, just not letting anything, not letting anything stand in your way or let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm not a, not necessarily a writer, director, creator, um, but you know, I'm from a tiny, tiny town in Texas. Like 
a lot of people don't leave those tiny towns. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I did it and it was hard. And sometimes I still wake up I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Um, but now it's like, even if you are in that tiny town, you could be making really cool stuff and putting right. it on the internet and some, and like, you could just like skip all the stuff I did yeah. and just get right into it, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, another long answer. No, no, I love it. And I appreciate you sharing all your long answers. It was really, uh, really helpful. And I, I think for people listening, it's gonna be helpful as well. And I'm looking forward to all the projects that you have coming up. Um, you know, wallpaper for sure is, is right up my alley with a lot of the other topics I cover, uh, on other platforms. And I'm excited to see, I mean, Bryce Dallas Howard's feature debut. I mean, that's, yeah. that's really exciting, but all the, all the work you're doing, I'm, I'm excited to see it, see it coming. And, uh, excited for everything you have coming up. Well, thank you, Eric. It was great talking to you. I really appreciate you.